As we move on with talking about the things related to salvation, we're looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, primarily our focus will be around 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, where it's talking about the immersion of the Holy Spirit there. Prior to this, we were talking about our relationship with God and how it has actually changed. We are actually born again. You know, that is really important to understand because that being born again impacts our ability to understand spiritual things because now we're born from above. We have a spirit that's actually alive. We have been washed from our sins. The Holy Spirit was the one who was involved in that. He washed us from our sins. He, re he is the one who regenerates us. And then, of course, as a result of that, God's as a result of that, God actually indwells us. You know, I was kind of tripping over my tongue there because it's all three persons of the Godhead that actually indwell us. You know, the primary focus today is on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in relation to living out the indwelling of Christ, the Christ that is in us. But even the Father does actually uh, indwell the believers because all three members are there. As a result of this, we can actually mature. You know, it's something very important for us as Christians to understand. You know that law does not allow you to mature. This is why we're not under law. We're under grace, because we can mature. And of course, that maturity involves exercising our senses so that we can discern what is wrong and what is right. And this, of course, that wrong and right would always be based upon the standard God has for us not upon the standard of anybody else. God created a new man, and we also looked at that, and this new man is referred to as the Christ, where Christ is the head and the church is actually the body. Why? Because the old man, which is Adam, was corrupt. And remember, we as humans are not individual creations of God. Scripture is very clear about that. We are one creation. Therefore, if the head is corrupt, the entire creation is corrupt, which is why we needed a new man. And God actually takes that man, this new man who is now, he, he is created in righteousness. And again, that would be Christ or referred to in scripture as the Christ, where Christ is the head and the church is the body. And we talked about that last week. Now, all of this is fine, but then how do we actually get into the Christ? And this is where it involves immersion into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm using the word immersion now instead of baptism because we want to actually translate the word baptizo, which we, um, we transliterate and we say baptism. But technically, baptism is a Greek word, which means there is no definition to it. And that is not an appropriate way to understand anything. We need to actually understand it in our own language. What does the word baptize mean in our own language? It literally means to immerse something. It is used of dyeing garments. Now, this is outside of scripture, where it actually, because remember the koine, the, the scripture or the language that scripture was written in is the common language of the men at that time, which would be the Koine language, common Greek. It wasn't high-flown Greek. It wasn't religious Greek. It was just the common language of the time. So we can go outside of scripture and we can see how these particular words were used at that time. And one example of this immersion is talking about garments. Now, we don't baptize garments in water. We immerse them in, in to dye so that it permanently affects the garment. It's the same thing, by the way, being used of a sword being dipped into blood before battle. Now, of course, that, the indication there is the, the now that the sword has blood on it, it'll do better at battle or something like that. Obviously, you have a, a little bit of superstition behind that. But you get the same concept and same idea there. Once immersed, the effect is permanent. You cannot take it out. Even a cheap dye 
won't ever fully come out of garment. It just doesn't work that way. You can mask it, but the reality is once you've uh, immersed it into it, it's permanent. And it does not, by the way, mean to sprinkle. And there are some who want to imply sprinkling. And they want to take that to, you know, like the, the baptism of children and, and little babies and sprinkling them. But that's not actually scriptural, and that's not what it's referring to. And we do have a perfectly good Greek word for sprinkle. We see that over in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Um, that's actually, the word elect should not be there. The word elect in here should be farther up. It's dispersed according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's your word sprinkle. So we don't have an issue between whether this word could be used as a sprinkling or actually means immersion because we literally have two different words that describe these types of actions. So when we're talking about baptism, we're actually talking about immersion. You're being immersed into something. The immersion of the, of the spirit is actually prophesied about. And we see an example of this over in Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. And it says, I indeed immerse you in water, but he will immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, I did adjust our words. So our translations will say baptize. But John the Baptist here is talking about, I'm, I'm immersing you into water. But the one coming is going to immerse you by the Holy Spirit. We are immersed into the body of Christ. This is how we actually get into the body of Christ. Now, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the one body being many are one body, thus also is the Christ. Now, I know a lot of our translations will drop the article there, and they'll just say, thus is Christ. But understand the context. Because it's very clear, even without the article, that it's not talking about the person Christ. Because it goes on to say, for also by one spirit, we're all immersed into one body. And whether Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free, and we have all been made to drink unto one spirit. In Adam, we were procreated. So we came from Adam because we're his offspring. Now, we came from Adam after Adam corrupted his nature by rejecting God and sending against what God had, the standard that God had placed upon him. And he passed that down to us. In Christ, how we get into Christ is by immersion. And yeah, once we're immersed into Christ, we're no longer in Adam, which means our head is no longer corrupt. Our head is righteous. The body is one, yet has many members. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 14. For also the body is one, is not one member, but many. So there's many of us involved in the body, but we're all part of the body. When placed into the Christ, we are given a spiritual gift. So... Part of our salvation and the things that we're actually given in salvation is we are taken out of Adam where we were condemned before God and we're placed into Christ. That is, we're literally immersed into Christ. Where now Christ is righteous, therefore we are seen as righteous before God. And being placed into this new body, we are actually given a spiritual gift that relates to the position we have in the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all things, determining to, to each one individual, or excuse me, distributing to each one individually as he determines. Not easy to see in the original or in our translations, but in the original language it says it is his by his determinate will. That is, the Holy Spirit determines what gift you will have. You do not determine it. Your 
be you being predisposed to a certain type of skill doesn't determine it. It's actually the Holy Spirit who determines what position we have within the body. Now, when it comes to spiritual gifts, we are not to be ignorant about them. And Paul starts out 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with that statement, because he's talking about us being immersed into the body of Christ. But he starts out with the fact that we are not to be ignorant in relation to spiritual gifts. Now, con concerning spiritual, you know, our translations add the word gift there, but it's spiritual things. Brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. And in the context, it is referring to this gift that we receive, this spiritual gift. The revelatory gifts have now ceased. And there's good reason for that when we follow it through in Scripture. There's no reason for God to be uh, expressing these types of gifts for a couple. There's a couple of good reasons for this. Number one, we have the full revelation now. So we don't need prophets. What is the purpose of having a prophet? You need information from God that you do not possess. Did the prophets ever go back and, and give Israel the law again? Israel already had the law. But Israel did not have all of the information related to what God was going to do. And more information was given to them. They needed prophets. At the beginning of the church, we didn't have any information on the church. We needed prophets in order to understand things. There were certain spiritual gifts that were given to the church so we could function as a church because we didn't have all the information yet. But now, today, we actually do possess all of it. On top of that, Israel was actually offered this position within the church first before the Gentiles. Why? Because Israel actually, the, the whole point of coming, the Messiah, was for Israel. And Israel sh should have actually had the position that we now have. But Israel rejected it. Therefore, it was offered to the Gentiles also. Well, how does God deal with Israelites? He gives them a sign. That's why we have some of the sign gifts. So they understood this was actually coming from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 says, Love never fails or falls. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. That's actually kind of... Um, that's a, a little difficult to understand there because it's using the same English word for two completely different Greek words. The first word, fall, actually means, or fails, where it says love never fails. It literally means to fall down, to trip, fall over. The second one where it says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. This word actually means to render something ineffective. It's a working term. Well, prophecies work, but what would render a prophecy ineffective? The full revelation. If we know all the information, what value does a prophecy have if it's giving us the exact same information we already possess? There's no effect anymore. This is not saying that God will not give prophecy in the future, but it is talking about the church here. And whether there are tongues, they will actually cause themselves to cease. The cease, the, the one who's causing the action here on the ceasing is actually the tongues, which I thought was very interesting. Why would the tongues cause themselves to cease? Because the purpose for speaking in tongues would no longer be of value. So there's no reason to speak in tongues. Whether there is knowledge, now this is the spiritual gift of knowledge. It will vanish away. No, no. It was the same word for prophecy. It will be rendered ineffective. Now, again, why would the need or why would knowledge, which is the need of information in, in order to understand how to function within the church, why would that be rendered ineffective? We have the full revelation. As a matter of fact, we have everything we need in Scripture in relation to how we are to manage a church. We already have all of that, so we don't need more. We don't need that gift. Therefore, the active gifts today are for the edification of the church. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Now, keep it in context here. We are in a period of time where Paul is writing this, where some of the revelatory gifts are still active. But yet, Paul is saying, you don't do that out of order. You do it appropriately. And the purpose is for the edification of the church, not the edification of an individual. So even when, when prophecy and tongues were actually active, they were not to use them inappropriately. As a matter of fact, in this particular passage, he rebukes them for speaking in a tongue where nobody actually understands what they're saying. No value to it. In addition, Scripture is very clear that speaking in tongues was assigned to the unbelieving Jew. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is for the unbeliever. But for the, or not for the unbeliever, but for those who actually believe. Which, of course, makes sense, because how, why would an unbeliever believe a prophecy? They don't understand God. They don't believe in him. The believers do. So at this time, we had those active. But you'll notice that the tongues is not for the believer. Those claiming to speak in tongues today are under the influence of another spirit. Now, this does make it very difficult to talk to people who claim that they speak in tongues. Because they are actually being influenced by another spirit. They're claiming it's the Holy Spirit. But if you actually follow scripture, you can see that it cannot be the Holy Spirit because it contradicts scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. For if... He who uh, comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if you receive a different spirit which, we have, which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you do well to put up with it. Paul, again, is rebuking the Corinthian saints because he's saying, hey, there's somebody coming preaching a different Jesus. And they're bringing a different, a different kind of spirit, yet you put up with this but you won't put up with the truth. Personal experience does not override scripture. Now, this is something that can be very difficult for people because especially in the world of where you have this false speaking in tongues, healing and other things like that, you know, the eyes can be tricked. The ears can be tricked into, into believing something. And people can truly believe that they have actually seen something like a healing or something else. A miracle. When all in all actuality, it doesn't really happen that way. The eyes were actually tricked into believing something. And the mind was manipulated into believing it was actually something from God. Now, I know there's people are out there that are going to say, oh, no, no, I absolutely know this. And I'm sure you were persuaded about it. But if it contradicts what Scripture says, how do we deal with that? That's actually important. Because those who speak in tongues, how do they actually deal with the fact that Scripture contradicts it? Oh, well, they'll say there's three different types of tongues. Yeah, there's three different types of the spiritual gift of tongues. Now, of course, when we looked in Scripture, it says... Tongues being a single type, another language. So there's the first revelatory, which they claim is uh, where it was assigned to the Jews. The second one they claim is it is a prayer language. And they, they strip this out of 1 Corinthians 14, completely ignoring the context there, because Paul says, when I pray in a tongue. But you'll know, actually, that word pray means worship. How do we worship in a tongue? Well, sometimes we sing. Sometimes we say things. But it's verbal. Now, if I start worshiping in another language that you don't know, how are you going to join in with me? So that's what he's talking about. 
And then some want to say that it's the, the uh, language of angels. You know, we're speaking in the language of angels, and it's a special prayer language private to, between me and God. But how can that be true if the gifts are for the edification of the church, not the individual? See, it contradicts scripture. And the reality is we have to come to an understanding that it is either what God says or what man says. And when man contradicts God, how should we react? Let God be true and every man be a liar. Because there's something God cannot do that men have no problem with doing. God, in, in the being that he is, down to his very core, cannot lie. So if he says something, it's truthful. Okay. So when scripture contradicts our experiences, our personal experiences, scripture is the one that needs to rule. Which means, yeah, you might have seen some pretty incredible things. And I can tell you personally, I have seen some pretty incredible things. I've been around those circles. I've had my eyes tricked into believing something. But when I look at scripture, and, I, and, I, and this had to do with a healing. And when I look at scripture and I understand, especially in relation to when Jesus actually healed people, that directly impacted them. Not only did it impact him, he sent him over to the priest to verify that it actually happened. Or in this case, no, there was no verification of reality. And the end result really was there was no actual healing at all. It just appeared that way. This is what they rely on. Because they're manipulating understanding in relation to spiritual gifts. But we as Christians are not to be ignorant when it comes to spiritual gifts. We do have a spiritual gift. We are part of one body. But that spiritual gift that we have is for the edification of the church. So if you want to claim that you speak in tongues and you don't want to actually verify it by getting your Google Translator out. Because remember, speaking in tongues, and if you take it scripturally, it's literally a known language. Okay. If you don't have somebody who interprets that, keep your mouth shut anyway. You know, if people actually listen to Paul on that, we wouldn't have Pentecostal and Charismatic Assemblies. Because they completely ignore it. And by the way, I'm not going to pick on just Charismatic and Pentecostal. There's all kinds of churches that let this stuff into them. And it's not appropriate. And it's a manipulation of understanding the things we get at salvation. We get a spiritual gift. So here, healing, miracles, the word of knowledge, testing spirits, prophecies, all of these has, have actually ceased because the completion of the revelation has come. And Israel rejected what God was offering. So now it's being given to the Gentiles. Now, when God is dealing with the Gentiles, how does he actually show the Gentiles he's doing something? The Gentiles don't seek a sign. We seek knowledge. We want wisdom. We want to understand things. So a sign to us really has no value. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part will be done away with. Not an easy passage to understand because of our breaking up of our books in chapters and verses. And what do I mean by that? Remember, chapters and verses are not part of the original letter. And I say letter, not book. Why? Because... 1 Corinthians was actually a letter written to the church, which means you read it as a letter. Now, as we're writing a letter and we refer to something that we've previously talked about, typically we do not rewrite that because it's within the context of what we're talking about. The perfect thing here actually means a word. It, it's literally your word uh, complete not perfect like there's no error 
It's to bring, bring to completion or bring to its intended end. Goes all the way back to the second chapter of Corinthians where we have the testimony of God. And some translations will say mystery. You know, it's very clear that it goes back there. And, it's, it's, and in understanding that, it means once we have the full revelation in relation to the testimony of God or the new things that God is telling us, the old things, the things out from apart, which would involve a word of knowledge, healing for verification, and prophecy, they're rendered ineffective because we're no longer working from apart. We have the whole thing now. Now, because we are immersed into the body of Christ, we are actually immersed into the death of Christ. It is quite interesting that this is in the mind of God. But God cannot lie. So God sees us as having already been immersed into Christ's death. That is, he's, he's imputed Christ's death to us. Or do you not know that as many of have been immersed into Christ Jesus, into his death have been immersed? Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. But we're not dead. Because if we were immersed into Christ's death, what happened to Christ? They put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. Which means if we are connected to his death, we're also connected to his resurrection. So we are therefore raised to walk in newness of life with Christ. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore we have been buried with him through the immersion into the death. In order that just as Christ was raised out from the dead through the proper opinion of God the Father or the Father. Thus also we in newness of life should walk. It involves the circumcision of the sins of the flesh. We are separated from who we were in Adam by the immersion into Christ. This is over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. In whom you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of these sins of the flesh by the circumcision of the Christ, buried with him in immersion, that's how it's actually removed from us, because we're buried with him in immersion, in whom you also were raised through faith in the workings of God who raised him from the dead. Death separates us from our sin nature. Now that death is imputed to us, and where are we actually saved right now? We're saved in our spirit. Our physical body isn't saved yet. Which means our physical body isn't separated from our sin nature yet. But we actually have a part of us that is separated from our sin nature. And when we function from that part, our sin nature just cannot get us to do what it wants it, us to do. Why? Because from our spirit, as we function from our spirit, we have been born again with an incorruptible seed that cannot be impacted by the sin nature. So when we function from our spirit, the sin nature's desires don't work against it. This all comes down to the fact that we've been placed into Christ. In our salvation, he has actually done this. So therefore, it renders the sin nature ineffective when we function from our position in Christ. That is, get your mind framed properly, who you are in Christ what God says about you, and start acting appropriately. Stop acting like a, a, a worthless sinner and start acting like a saint, because that's who you are in Christ. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, and experientially knowing this, that the old man was co-crucified in order that the body of the sin, and is referring to the sin nature here, should be rendered ineffective so that we are no longer slaves to the sin nature. Oh, yeah, those desires that, that do wrong, even though we want to do what's right, we find ourselves doing what is wrong. You know, we're no longer a slave to that. But we have to properly frame our minds and start yielding to righteousness in order to have victory over it. Yep. 
it removes our condemnation. So being immersed into Christ actually removes our condemnation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, Then now there is no condemnation to the ones in Christ Jesus. Condemnation means we're under judgment. We're under the penalty of a judgment. If some translations, primarily the New King James, adds in a section in here that doesn't belong. If you walk by the spirit, not by the flesh, if I recall, if that's what it was. That doesn't belong in, in there. And what do I mean by it doesn't belong in there? Don't take my word at it. Go back to the original language. You'll see that it actually isn't in the original writings. It was added in later. As a matter of fact, if I recall, it was basically translations. The Vulgate was the primary one where this was added in. Because somebody comes along and they're saying, oh, no, no, we cannot live without being condemned. We have to have condemnation over us. So there has to be a condition on that. But there is no condition on it because we've been taken out of Adam and we've been placed into Christ. So one of the things we actually receive in relation to our salvation is we are no longer under condemnation. We are now seen as ones who are righteous. Now, there is only one immersion. There are not multiple immersions. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 says, One Lord, one faith, one immersion. Singular. Water baptism is for a, is for a good conscience, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. So water baptism, and yes, we still baptize by water, but water baptism has nothing to do with salvation. It has to do with your conscience. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 talks about this. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism or immersion, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water baptism does not bring salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Now in the context, Paul is talking about immersion into water. Now think about that. Paul said, Christ did not send me to immerse people in water. He did immerse some. But the immersion was for a good conscience. It wasn't for the cleansing of sins. But to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, least the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And of course, that wisdom of words would be using words to persuade people. That no, I'm just here to present the truth. And I'm not here to baptize all of you in water. So you do not actually, in relation to the church, have a water immersion and a spirit immersion. They are not two separate immersions in relation to our salvation. There is one immersion. Ephesians very clearly said, one immersion. And of course, Scripture is very clear. We've been immersed into the Christ. One immersion. Water baptism is a representation for a good conscience of what has happened in spiritual immersion. <clears throat> Now, by the way, spiritual immersion, um, well, that thought just jumped out of my head, sorry. <laughs> I saw the next slide, and it just popped right out of my head. Okay, um, because actually I was thinking about this, you know, when it comes to uh, understanding the immersion of the Holy Spirit and the involvement of the Holy Spirit in the church, I think we need to go back to really understand what was going on at the beginning of the church. Because there's some things there that can be a little confusing if you're not paying attention to what God is doing. Now, it involves immersion by the Holy Spirit. So the beginning of the church actually involves the immersion of the by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. For John truly immersed with water, but you shall be immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Now, this is after the resurrection of Christ. He's talking to the disciples. He's instructing them that they need to stay in Jerusalem for a time because the immersion of the Holy Spirit hasn't happened yet. There's still some other things that have to come that have to happen before this. Now, these things relate to heavenly things, not earthly things. So the disciples are instructed to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the promise from the Father, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. I'm going to immerse you by the Holy Spirit. That's what he actually said. So that's the promise. So now we get to the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. The Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples at this point. We have the sound of a rushing wind, Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound of uh, out from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it was and it filled the whole house where they were where they were sitting or seating. <clears throat> sitting. You can say that word properly. It sounded like a rushing mighty wind. But there wasn't a rushing mighty wind. There was a sound. We have the Holy Spirit coming. This sound was so loud, it drew Jerusalem, the city. It drew all these people over to figure out what is going on with this sound. This mighty wind that we suddenly heard come through the city, but yet nothing moved. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, and by the way, devout men would refer to saved Jews under the law, from every nation under heaven. And when they and when this sound occurred, the multitude came, multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. The first aspect of speaking in tongues. Who was it spoken to? Devout Jews from every nation why because god is telling the jews hey i'm doing something different pay attention again it's assigned to the jews acts chapter 2 verse 11 Christians and Arabs, and it gave a whole long list before that. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of god and this actually this word tongues here is dialect it's a little bit more specific in what god is actually saying there we have the dividing of tongues that look like fire, Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. Then there appeared as to them divided tongues as of fire. They are not fire. They look like there's a similarity to it. We are never immersed in fire. There is no baptism by fire in Scripture. As a matter of fact, if you want to talk about baptism into fire, fire is always judgment. So you couldn't really use that if you if you stick with what Scripture says. You can't use that as a part of our salvation. Because in our salvation, we are not appointed unto any wrath, any quality of God's wrath. We're appointed unto salvation. It came upon them. And you'll notice here, and again, a little difficult in some of our translations because they don't really give us good um, definitions of the word. Because here it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, it actually uses a specific type of word that means to fill in a mental controlling way. Now, this is important to understand because this is not the same type of filling we have in relation to the church today. This type of filling they had is the Old Testament type of filling, where the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody, but he would control the way they were thinking. Luke chapter 1 and verse 15 talks about this. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his, uh, his mother's womb. Talking about the John the Baptist here. Now the Holy Spirit we see in scripture, he ultimately does leave John for a while. And this is when John is in prison because Israel has actually rejected their Messiah. But we see John was actually filled up where he was controlled. We also see in Luke chapter 1 and verse 67, now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he was filled, controlling. And what was the response of that? He started to prophesy. 
used by the Holy Spirit only in the beginning of the church, this type of filling. It is clearly a sign to the Jews, and we see this in Acts chapter 7, or Acts chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, where it's very clearly a sign that's being used here. It is also used in defense of the gospel to the Jews at the beginning of the church. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and people of and elders of Israel. Now he's responding to them. He's filled, he's mentally controlled when he responds to them by the Holy Spirit. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Now this, in this case, it was a defense of the gospel, and Paul was mentally controlled at this point by the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he was going to respond from was a judgment directly from God. At the beginning of the church with the elders of Israel, it's like, Peter, I got this one. <laughs> I'm going to tell them what I think about what they're doing. Yeah, but I'm going to use you as the instrument. Same thing with Paul. Same way. Completely different from the type of filling we have today. Until the full revelation came, we needed this type of filling. But once the full revelation came, we didn't need this type of filling anymore. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 10 again. It is different from our type of filling. We see over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, and it says, it said, Stop being drunk with wine in which there is no savingness, but be filled where you're lacking by the Holy Spirit. Completely different word. Completely different type of filling. Where do we lack in our ability to manifest the eternal life that we actually possess because we're in Christ? That fruit of the Spirit. We lack the ability to produce that and to use it. So the Holy Spirit comes in and makes it possible for us to actually use it. He fills us up where we're lacking. I'm going to um, I'm gonna do a little bit more or come back to this and talking about this a little bit more because we're running out of time at this point. Because I think it's important to understand as we progress at the beginning of the church, the Holy Spirit was doing some different work, but that doesn't change the immersion into the body of Christ, nor the immersion by the Holy Spirit. There's one immersion, and that's all there is to it. Now, he was doing some signs and some wonders and other things in relation to showing the Israelites what he was doing. But that doesn't change the fact that when it comes to the things of our salvation, there is one immersion, and that immersion is into the body of Christ.